quick question. Um, is OBS, um, does it, is it working right it's now for you? It's capturing this here. Okay. Have you checked it? I just want to make sure so you wouldn't have an issue later. Check it. It's recording, and I've tested it out. It should be fine, so this is what it's here. Let me see for a second. So what I can do is... So it's capturing here, so, okay, perfect. There you go. You know 100% okay. it works, so... That's what we're showing. I don't want that on. All right, anything else for me? No problem. Um, quick question. Um, so, are you, how often are you guys doing this? Just so next time, you every, 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 every week, on, every Wednesday, what time? Seven. Okay. Um, can I write down my email and just send me a good reminder, and then I'll put it on my calendar for that here every time. So. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Like I don't have paper. Yeah. <laughs> Wall to wall, 
leaning forward in their seat, so excited to hear about that rare sedge and that thing that doesn't bloom that often. <coughs> that great. They are fascinating. They're very entertaining, and I'm sure they're going to do more of that uh, tonight. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you uh, Steve Sass, a big leader in both Audubon and in Paws, and in the Native Plant Wildflower Society, and uh, Scott Nets. He's uh, with Corvus Environmental and a uh, plant guru. So uh, they're going to talk to you a little bit about the light at Corvus, so please uh, make a good one. one of those sort of housekeeping things. They're going to talk for half an hour-ish. Um, we're going to pause. Um, I'm going to interview them a little more in depth about some of the things they've talked about, the things that they're wondering about, and then you get to interview them by asking questions. So we're going to break out the next uh, hour, hour and a half or so into three chunks. So that's what's coming. Thank you, Krista. Thank you all for attending this this evening. Um, I'm Steve. I'm Scott. And um, we're going to talk about the, a little bit about the Lydic Corridor, or more specifically about um, a, a specific property of the story about um, a specific property and how we came upon finding this property and some of the subsequent things that have happened since then. Um, i to fumble a little bit, I guess, with advancing the slides here. Do you want to, what's up? Oh, the mouse, okay. Hopefully. We're already off to a slow start here, <laughs> um, or I think so the no, I think the space this bar. Oh, this here. keyboard. Okay, yeah. space bar. No, no. There we go. Okay, so if, if you're from, not familiar with this area, the area that we're talking about is um, this outlined area, which is west of this is the U.S. 31 bypass. The, uh, the South Bend Airport's there, Blackthorn Golf Course is there. And um, if you notice on this little band here that extends north-south, we have a, a number of different lakes that, that are um, small, what are called pedal lakes, which were formed by big chunks of ice that fall off of the last glaciers as they move through the area here. Um, some of you may know this area, South Bend Country Club is down here. This is Chamberlain Lake, which is a state-dedicated nature preserve. Um, this is called the Chain of Lakes region, that's South Chain Lake, um, that's North Chain Lake or Bass Lake, this is called Augustine Lake, Elbow Golf Course is uh, bounded and partially surrounded by Mud Lake, and then uh, here we have the Indiana Michigan Line, Clear Lake, and Deer Lake. So there was, you can imagine this, the, the, this enormous uh, glacier moved through there and as it retreated, chunks of ice fell off and created this, this lake system. So that's the area that we're talking about. I'm going to turn things over to Scott and he's going to tell us so the, the next part of the story. So our story begins, this isn't going to advance the slide. So our story begins, advances the slide. Here, I'll get it for you. There, got it. Okay. Our story begins with a man named Jerry Wilhelm, and Jerry is a botanist who lives in the suburbs of Chicago. He's most well known for his work as a co-author of the 1994 book, Plants of the Chicago Region. And Jerry's recently been working with Laura Rorica, another botanist in Chicago, on a revision to that book, which is going to be called The Flora of the Chicago Region. And that book's going to come out here in the next few weeks. Um, but in the process of working on that, back in the late winter, early spring of 2014, Jerry gave me a call one Saturday morning inquiring about a plant that he had never seen in the Chicago region but that had been documented from our region before. And that plant was Sheepsaria palustris, or Rannick rush. <clears throat> and unfortunately, I had never seen this plant in the Chicago region or in Indiana either, so I couldn't tell Jerry that I knew exactly where it was found, but I had seen it in a bog in North Ohio, so I had an idea of what it looked like, I had an idea of where it would be found, and as I was talking to Jerry, I started remembering back to a series of papers that I had read by Father Newland from Notre Dame, who was a botanist and a chemist there in the early to mid-1900s, and Father Newland had written um, in 1912 and 1913 a series of papers called Notes on Our Local Plants. And I remember reading that paper, and something struck me that I remembered seeing something about Sheep's area palustris in that paper, so I went back to that paper. And lo and behold, I did find that Father Newland had documented Schutzeria palustris in our region, in, in the South Bend area. 
And so looking more closely at what Father Newland said about Chutes Area Palestras, he said that in Chain Lakes, Indiana, in St. Joseph County, we found it in open spaces of tamarack bogs, commonly throughout that region, with other plants associated with it, like purple pitcher plant, and cranberry, and sundews, and bog, uh, bog buckwheat. And so this gave me an idea of kind of where I should start looking for this plant. I was immediately on this mission to find the Chutes Area Palestras. So the first thing that I did after finding this paper and telling Jerry I'm finding that, I'm going to tell you where it's at, um, was I went to trusty Google Earth and I looked at some aerial imagery. And as I looked up and down that Chain Lakes region, I started keying in on this spot just north of North Chain Lake. And so the untrained eye is made to look like a little green and tan blob. I've done a little bit of aerial photography interpretation over the years. And what I saw when I looked at this, especially when I zoomed in, was that there was this darker spot right there in the middle, that when you get even closer, you see some even darker trees mixed in with the lighter colored trees. And I was convinced that those were tamaracks. And there's this ring right around the outside of that that's a little bit darker as well. Bogs characteristically have a moat that surrounds them around their perimeter. So I saw this, and I saw a bog. I saw that moat around it, and I saw the tamaracks, and I said, I need to find a way to get out there. But how do I get out there? So I thought about the people that I knew in Northwest St. Joe County, and someone who might know some of the landowners who might have a way to get into this place to see if it was a bog. And so I called this guy. And you might recognize this guy <laughs> as, as Steve Sass. Steve um, is from New, or lives in New Carlisle and, and knows a lot of the landowners there. So I thought Steve might have an idea for how to get in. So I told him the story. I said, here's where we got to go, Steve. How do we do this? Steve said, well, I've got an idea. We're going to put in our canoe at the Chain of Lakes Conservation Area. We're going to row through North Chain Lake and up into this lobe in North Chain Lake. And then we're going to get out from there and we're going to walk into the bog. Sounds easy enough, right? <coughs> so we tried it. We tried it. So Steve and that slide didn't show up. Oh, didn't. Steve and his daughter, Sarah, and I um, went out on June 14th, 2014. Unfortunately, you can't see the slide here to see what it looked like. We rode to that point. We got into some of the thickest spatterdock and pickerel weed and swamp and strike that you could ever imagine. And outside of that, there was no land. It was unconsolidated muck. There was no way we were getting out of the canoe, so we gave up on that option. So then I went home, back to the drawing board, continued to look at this area, tried to figure out a way to get in. And I called my buddy Roger Hedge at the Indiana uh, Department of Natural Resources Division of Nature Preserves, and I told him the story as well. And Roger has access to a lot of records that most of the general public doesn't. And so I asked him to check his records and see if anybody ever documented a log from this area. He went back and looked at the records, and someone had been in this area from the, the Department of Natural Resources in the late 70s, early 80s, but their notes were very cryptic. There wasn't much information on what was in there. But Roger, after looking at the aerial imagery as well, said, yeah, we need to get in there. It looks pretty good from the, the aerial imagery. It does look like a bog. So we tried to find a way to get in, and, and Roger made some phone calls, and we eventually decided that we were going to walk from the end of Lakewood Avenue up into the bog, through the woods and down into the bog, if it was in fact a bog. So Roger came up from Indianapolis on, that one's not short up either, well, on uh, August 18th of 2014, hopefully some of these photos show up, and uh, it was a bog in fact. And oh, it's there, it's just like yeah, super dark, it crazy. It black. It's weird. It is weird. Um, so yeah, it, this is not what a bog looks like. <laughs> this, is, this is a bog at night. Um, we were there during the day. Um, so it was a bog, and it was, in fact, hopefully some leaves, yeah. There we go. Here's uh, another image of what it looked like. It was actually a really nice bog. And so you can see um, that there's a tamarack tree here, there's some poison sumac. All those bog plants are there. Not only was it a bog, it was a highly intact bog, full of native plants, lacking non-native species for the most part. <coughs> so... Uh, as we continued to, to look through that bog, we found that it was an acid, acid sedge and sphagnum bog. And it had species like yellow lake sedge, round leaves, sundew, sphagnum mosses covered the ground underneath the herbaceous plants. Uh, poison sumac was very common. And there were several carnivorous plants, including the round leaf sundew that I mentioned. One of those carnivorous plants is the purple pitcher plant, which is fairly common out there, <clears throat> which is shown here in these photographs. 
Purple picture plane, this is a little bit off topic, but it's a really cool plane. All these carnivorous plants I'm going to talk about a little bit in more detail just because they're, they're so exciting. Uh, these carnivorous plants have developed carnivory as a means of getting additional nutrients because they live in these bogs. These bogs are acidic in nature and they're very low nutrient systems. So the plants that live there have to find a way to adapt to living in low nutrient systems. And these carnivorous plants have adapted by eating insects, essentially. So purple pitcher plant, the, the, uh, the plant produces a nectar that actually is laced with a narcotic. So that's cool enough as it is. Insects smell that nectar, very sweet smelling. They go to the plant to get that nectar. They get drugged. Then they sit down for a little rest on the rim of this pitcher, which is actually very slippery. They fall into the pitcher. That pitcher is full of rainwater. You can see the water inside that pitcher. So now they have to try it out. The waves are wet. They become very exhausted. They try to climb out, but unfortunately, that pitcher is covered in these downward pointed hairs that make it impossible for them to get out, or fortunately for the plant. They eventually die of exhaustion or of drowning. They fall to the bottom of that pitcher where there are digestive enzymes produced by that pitcher, which is actually the leaf of the plant, that digest the insect. The plant then takes in those nutrients. That's cool enough, right? That happens for the first couple of years. But then, after a couple of years, these leaves don't produce those enzymes anymore. To get around that, the plant has uh, developed a relationship with some midge and mosquito larvae that actually live in the pitcher, do the digestion for the plant, and the plant then takes up the nutrients from those other insects that fall into that pitcher. Crazy, commensal relationship, really cool plant, and they've adapted these, these amazing ways to live in these no, low nutrient systems. Anyways, back to the bog. Um, so on August 18th of 2014, and then again on July 27th of 2015, we conducted some informal plant inventories of a small portion of the bog. We documented 85 plant species, which actually is not very many, but for a bog, that's a pretty high level. Again, because of those low nutrient systems, the species richness is usually very low <coughs> in these bog systems. The, better, the, the more impressive number is that 95% of the species were native within that bog. Usually we find 70 to 80% of the plants native, unfortunately, it's a 70 to 80% now because of um, the non-native species that have moved into our region. Usually it's 70 to 80% is what we find in the site. Like, uh, this bog had 95% native species. The mean C value and the FQI value, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about those, but those are, are um, ways to kind of look at a natural system to determine the quality of it. The mean C value is the mean coefficient of conservatism value, so it's an average of all of the coefficient of conservatism values for all of the plants on the site. Those values are, each, each plant has a C value, a coefficient of conservatism. It's been assigned by botanists, ranges from 0 to 10, with 10 being at the high end, 0 being at the low end. The zero plants are um, very generalist, they'll grow in any situation under a lot of degradation. Um, the 10 seed on plants are the high quality things that are more finicky, that only grow in natural systems, remnant systems, uh, non degraded systems. And so each one of those plants has a C value, and the average of those is the mean C value. It's been said that sites that have mean C values of 4.5 are natural areas. Here we're two points over 4.5, so you can see the quality of, of this bog system is way up there in terms of uh, other sites that we would see in this area. And the FQI is, is the Floristic Quality Index. Similarly, that number, um, it gives you an idea of the quality of the site. Here we have a 60.8 FQI, um, which is again an indicator of very high quality. Usually you see up to about 45, anything over 45 is a high quality natural area. So we had, um, once we ran these numbers and applied the Floristic Quality Assessment, we saw that we had a very high quality natural area um, in, in the bog that we eventually called Nidic Bog. <coughs> We also have documented several endangered, threatened, or rare plant species in the bog. Um, I say seven or eight here. You see the uh, Sheets area palustris or granite rush is on that list. Unfortunately, we have not found that in the bog yet. It's still my mission to find it. I still feel like it should be out there. All the associate species are there, the habitats there. Uh, and it's exactly what Father Newman had, had uh, described where he had found it. So that's a potential for the site. The other species on this list have all been found there with the exception recently of Pyrola chlorantha, which is listed as state extirpated, which means it no longer occurs in the state as far as we know. Um, but the last time that it was found, it was found in the area of Lydic Bog. The one other plant I want to point out is the one that's shown here on the right, uh, green adder's mouth orchid. 
And this is a plant that's state endangered, and that means that there is no from one to five locations or occurrences throughout the state. When we found this plant at Lighted Bog, it had never been documented in St. Joseph County before. So that gives you an idea of the importance of this bog um, the, to, to our natural areas in our, our region here in St. Joseph County. And we found at least 60 plants uh, of that green adder's mouth orchid. In addition to uh, those endangered, threatened, and rare species, I mentioned the carnivorous species already. I talked about the purple pitcher plant. Here's two other carnivorous plants that are found in the bog, and they both have different ways of, of uh, digesting insects, attracting and digesting insects. The round leaf sundew on the bottom <coughs> has these tiny glands on the leaves. You can see those glands. It has two different types. There are stalk glands. You can see very clearly in those. Those glands are the little sticky, sugary substances at the tips of those stalks. It also has sessile glands. The stalk glands attract insects. They have that sugary substance, so insects come to feed on that sugary stuff substance, and they get stuck. And as they try to get out, they eventually get too tired and can't get out, and they die from exhaustion. That's when the sessile glands, or those unstalked glands that are right on the surface of the leaves, take over, and they produce a digestive enzyme that creates a bug soup, essentially, that's then sucked in by the leaves, and that's how the plant gets nutrients. The great bladderwort, has yet another way of attracting or of, of uh, trapping insects and then digesting them. So this is the flowering portion of the great bladderwort, and the leaves are underwater. Here's a close-up of the leaves. You can see these bladders or sacs that are on the leaves, and that's why it's called a bladderwort. Each one of those tiny bladders has little trigger hairs that uh, surround a trap door. And as an insect floats by those trap doors, they touch the trigger hairs, the trap door opens, and that sac is under a negative pressure that sucks the insect in, the trap door shuts, and the insect is out of luck, it's never getting out of there. That sac then produces some uh, digestive enzymes, creates, a, again, a bug soup that's taken in by the plant, and that's how it gets its nutrients. These crazy ways of adaptation that have allowed these plants to be able to be successful in these bog situations. There are also lots of other conservative plant species, so species that have those conservatism values of 8, 9, or 10 that are on the site. Way too many to, to talk about and uh, to list here, but I just wanted to show a couple of those higher quality ones uh, in these tables. And then in addition to all that, it's just a beautiful place. Lots of color uh, throughout the year. Uh, a lot of plants in the blueberry family, a lot of sedges, plants in the rose family, uh, cranberry uh, right here goes to fruit in the late summer within the bog as well, so um, it's just an amazing place. So I'm going to turn it back over to Steve now to continue from there. Thank you. So listening to Scott talk, you would think that you're, you're watching something on National Geographic about Africa and not about St. Joseph County. So I, I was blown away that we had wandered into this place that was like the land that time forgot, literally, as we were walking through there. And, and Scott didn't really touch too much on the story of getting in there, but like getting in out of this place, it was horrific that day. We were, we were, we were wearing um, uh, knee boots, and those we went over the top of those going through the moat almost immediately. So we knew we were just going to be soaking wet um, all day out there. And it was hot. It was, I think, it was August at the time that we went out there. So, but we were leaving there that day. We all, the three of us, um, Scott and, and Roger from DNR and myself, um, got back to the parking lot and we all kind of looked at each other and said, what do you think? And we're like, pretty amazing. Like, what are we going to do about it? And really nobody had thought much about it then. And we were just like, well, we got to do something. So, uh, I started, uh, my, my takeaway from that was uh, that I, I started working on doing some research about that area. I wanted to find out as much as I possibly could about this Lydic area, the Chain of Lakes area. And my search took me to the County Library Historical Room, as well as to the County Library uh, Online Documents, which there are a lot of old plat maps that are available. And uh, I look back at the, at the map from 1875, which is this one, of course, and it shows the, the lakes in the, the program description, Krista mentioned uh, a historical element to this area. There is certainly a historical element to this area, and that is that these chain lakes um, in, in this region were extraordinarily important to the Native Americans. And in this area, north of, this would be South Bend Country Club, 
right now. So there's an area that's kind of, uh, I guess it's over on, on this corner of, of, of um, South Chain Lake. Was said to have contained some of the most important Native American artifacts that have ever been found in St. Joseph County. They were excavated in the 1930s, led by uh, Mrs. Frederick Elbell, who, um, there were, who actually like, excavated the mounds that were there. So these aren't the Potawatomi Indians, these are the, the ones that they go way, way back in time. So in the 1875 map, we also see, we can see the, the, the water hydrology here, which is kind of interesting. This body of water is called the Grapevine Ditch, the locals call it, uh, or the Geyer Ditch, the locals call it the Grapevine. And um, if we look up here north of the Bass Lake, lo and behold, there's another tiny little lake up there. And uh, I was able to superimpose the Google Earth imagery over this map, and lo and behold, the the little lake up here lines up exactly with a bog. So in 1875, that, that bog was um, was an open lake. It was actually called Beaver Lake. And in later maps, it's, it takes on the name of Augustine Lake. And, uh, excuse me, Wolverton Lake. Augustine Lake is farther north. And uh, I did a little more research and I found out that Jacob Wolverton owned that property. It was an early industrialist in St. Joseph County and he had strong ties to Notre Dame. So now it's starting to click and I'm thinking, well, he owned that property. Uh, he probably knew Father Newland. He probably allowed Father Newland to come out and buy nice his property at that time. So um, we started, I started getting really excited about this. I put together this after the visit map and tried to, try to identify who owned all of this property that's out there. And so this gray area, this is our bog. Um, the areas in the red rectangles were owned by a uh, a trust of three siblings with the last name of Hurwich, who lived in the area. Uh, there was, they were um, the children of, of the man who purchased that property uh, a number of decades ago, who, who since passed away in the 90s and left it to his children. This area in orange is owned by the Chain Lakes Conservation Club. The yellow area is owned by the South Bend Airport Authority. And then over here, you have all of these little parcels that were subdivided back in some time. Um, probably in the 1930s or so. A lot of those, some of those were built, other ones were never built because the area is so wet out there and the hydrology is such that it doesn't make for good building sites. So I took this map and I included this part of a, a report that I did um, on, the, on the land ownership out there. I sent a copy to Roger at the Division of Nature Preserves and I sent a copy to Chris Krause, the Executive Director of Shirley Hines Land Trust, which is a a 30-some-year-old land trust that operates in Port Porter and um, Lake Counties of Indiana. But they had, Shirley Hines Land Trust had been discussing for several years the possibility of moving over into St. Joe County. St. Joe County was not, at the time, at least currently um, served by a staffed land trust. So land trust is, is an agency that basically purchases and protects high-quality land. Oh, here's our um, animation. So this was um, this was right after. I'm trying to think here. So this would have been August of 2014. The following summer, I got an email from Eddie Kirkwood, who's the director of St. Joseph County Parks, and she said, "You know that area that you were talking about that you and Scott explored?" And I said, "Yes." And she said, "I got a call from a realtor who." was a former member of the park board, and he was telling me about this property that's for sale, and it sounds like that same property that you were looking at. So it was, in fact, the Hurwitz property, which was almost 180 acres of land. Shirley Hines Land Trust became immediately interested. We had already provided them with the information about this property, Scott's botanical species list, the maps, all of that stuff had already been sent to them. The timing worked out amazingly well where it was all of a sudden for sale. So we returned back to the bog, um, or I did. Scott was not on that trip, but uh, he had been there one other time previous to that with uh, one of the, the uh, Division of Nature Preserve um, ecologists. And so on uh, in September 15th, 2015, Roger Hedge on the far right there, and I returned back to the bog with Shirley Hines Land Trust staff and land acquisition committee members. And we went back into the bog, and there it is, and you can see Tamarack Tree in the background, and 
Um, that's the, the, the beauty of it really can't be overstated, and also the difficulty of getting in and out of there. Not much transpired for a few months. We didn't really hear anything one way or the other. And then, um, gosh, just a little over a year ago, uh, we had a, a meeting here. Chris Krauss, who I mentioned is the executive director of Shirley Hines Land Trust, is uh, standing there in front, called a meeting to some of the various environmental people and stakeholders in St. Joseph County uh, to discuss Shirley Hines Land Trust involvement in St. Joseph County. And uh, it was at that point that we had learned that Shirley Hines had made an offer that was accepted on Hurwitz property, which you can see in the, in the yellow area there. Um, but this little U-shaped area of yellow contains an old farmhouse, and that was not um, eligible to be purchased, and we'll talk about that in a few, but... Uh, another slide that didn't show up, so um, that's okay. So uh, around the same time, there was a lot of buzz in the South Bend community with regards to the LL golf course. The city had announced, at least to the media, uh, that they were they were intending to sell the golf course. LL, if you remember from the earlier slides, is uh, it's a city park. It's it's part of that that whole chain of lakes area. It's north. It's almost the state line. Uh, it's a golf course, but it also has, it contains, or is bordered by Mud Lake, which is one of those, one of those main kettle lakes, or, or was, anyway. Um, the slide on, on the left, which is, or on the right, excuse me, which is, which is black, or is playing really, really dark there for some reason, was, um, I became interested in the, um, the sort of grassroots movement to oppose the people who were, who were concerned about the city sale. Of Eldel. And um, if you were to see that slide, you would see um, a, a picture of a bunch of people sitting literally in somebody's living room discussing what we're going to do about this. Fast forward into this uh, past summer, this was an invitation that I got in the mail of the official announcement that Shirley Hines Land Trust had purchased the, uh, the lighted bog, as we are now calling it. It's, it's colloquially known at least. And uh, this is the actual dedication ceremony. There's, uh, and Chris is in there, okay, there she is. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people, over 60 people from the community came out and showed up for the dedication ceremony. Some politicians, this is uh, Dale Enquist, who was the, the first superintendent of the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. He was also part of the Shirley Hines Land Trust Land Acquisition Committee. And that's State Representative Ryan Porek. So I should mention this, this is ex extremely important to mention that money for these things doesn't just come out of the air. Like Shirley Heinz Land Trust doesn't have copious amounts of money that they can just go out and buy 180 acres of property, which by the way was I think somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred thousand dollars is what they paid for the property. So uh, on his way out of office a few years ago, Governor Daniels set up something called the Bicentennial Nature Trust Fund, and a, a, a large sum of money was set aside to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Indiana's statehood. And uh, the money that was set aside by, by the state of Indiana was then also matched by the Eli Lilly Foundation. So this money was, was used to purchase high quality areas for preservation in Indiana as part of its bicentennial celebration. Um, Representative Dvorak was on the committee for the Bicentennial Nature Trust, and he was concerned that the money from this fund was largely going downstate to central Indiana, to southern Indiana, and he was looking for, like, actively looking for um, a project up here that would fit the um, the, the, the category of what the Bicentennial Nature Trust does. And uh, the Lighting Block turned out to be a perfect property for it. And so the, the Bicentennial Nature Trust paid for uh, about half of the, the cost of, of the bog, and Shirley Heights was able to get matches from some of their corporate donors for the rest of it. Um, in addition to the bog, because the bog is relatively small, we're only, I mean, what, 10 acres, would you say, or so of the bog, and, and of that, only two-thirds of it is actually part of the Hurwitz property. So there's a, 
160 some other acres up there that uh, we knew nothing about, that we had never looked at before. And this is a, a picture of it. This is some of the, the upland areas. This is on the dedication day. Uh, some some nice high quality uh, wood, woodlands and there's also some other wetlands out there and we're still sort of learning what all is out there. And so this is the two, the, the two acre plot that was in the U at that one photo I showed contained this farmhouse. And so this is on, this is as seen, I actually took this today, this is as seen from Highway 20, Lincoln Highway, and it's, it's over if anybody knows where the, the Ken Rose Motel is. That's like right across the street from there. So this two-acre parcel, Shirley Hines Land Trust, has an option to buy up until May 27th of this year from the Hurwitz family. This was not eligible for the Bicentennial Nature Trust money because it's not a natural area and it contains buildings and they just wouldn't pay for it. So they have to raise this money themselves to pay for it. Uh, $50,000. Or which is not bad for two acres with uh, you know an old farmhouse on it, but there are other plans for this property are is to actually you can't see there's some old dilapidated barns that are back there too. You can't see them over here. Um, they want to raise these buildings, uh, put in a parking lot that's large enough to accommodate buses so we can get schools out there. Um, and build a, a sort of a visitor center slash restroom facility. As, long, as well as some trails, which is um, the, the total price of that entire project is going to come in at around $200,000 to $250,000 or so to be able to do all of that. Um, so I feel like I'm talking too much. You want to talk about the conservation corridor? Okay, so out of the ashes of the, the, the elk elf, um, for everyone, people, which is the, the grassroots group that, that spoke up about the sale of, the sale of elk elf, um, it came the idea of producing a conservation corridor, which conservation corridors are, um, the word is popular, but they're, they're important to land trusts to be able to, when they, when they consider the purchase of a property, they're not just looking at that property, they're also looking at the other areas surrounding the property. High quality areas require buffer zones to keep um, invasive plants and, and other things out of them. And so, if we start looking at this region as a whole, we can go all the way down, we can see this sort of line that runs right through there, Potato Creek State Park, um, Clear, excuse me, Chamberlain Lake, which is a state dedicated nature preserve in a, in a super high quality area. Here's our Chamber Lake system, here's our, um, there we go, technical areas, our bogs right in here, Augustine Lake, Elbow Park, Mud Lake, Clear Lake, Deer Lake. So that was the, the program that we did back in um, March, February, I guess it was, at, um, here at IUSB, was um, attended by over 100 people. And uh, we talked about each of those lakes in the corridor. So that, that went on for three hours, because all of those lakes um, have their own special qualities to them. So continuing on, uh, on the, uh, the heels of the of the Elk Bell for Everyone group, um, a couple of the uh, local ladies, which are sustainability fellows here, uh, some of you may know Jennifer Betts and Christy Haas, um, formed or came up with the idea of forming a conservation alliance where we would pull in all of the various stakeholders and partners from St. Joseph and Elkhart County, get them all in the same room, and get them talking to each other. And so we can sort of create a larger vision. Um, the conservation corridor, I should probably back up to that, but the idea that, that um, we're looking at a, a larger picture scale on, um, rather than just looking at, okay, we're happy that we've protected Mud Lake and we have Chamberlain Lake down here, which is also protected. There's a lot of interconnecting um, high quality and, and medium quality areas that can sort of tie together to make that entire area a, uh, a destination. Sure. Um, the, the idea of conservation corridors, one of the greatest threats to our natural areas and to individual species that are at risk is fragmentation. These, these species are in these little tiny postage stamp properties. They can't move, the genetics don't move at all. So the idea of a corridor is connecting these little postage stamps, even if it's with not the greatest habitat or not the greatest quality areas, but connecting those so that there's movement 
both of those individuals and of the genes throughout those, those corridors to allow them to have a larger area to hopefully survive long-term in the future. And uh, one, one example of a species that actually is affected very negatively by fragmentation would be the eastern box turtle. Birds can fly, so they can, they can go over a road and um, they can find other birds to, to mate with that would increase the gene pool. But if you have this small segmented area, eventually the, the genes become an issue. Um, they give it back to you for, for your talking talk about the uh, botanical parts of this. So I guess um, what we have learned about uh, the bog itself and about some of the other lakes within this chain of lakes region um, is that there are some incredibly unique areas with lots of endangered, threatened, rare species. Um, there are lots of coastal plain disjunct species as well, which are plants that have the main portion of the range along the Atlantic coast uh, of the United States and down in the Gulf Coast. And then there's a gap in their, uh, their distribution where they don't occur inland, and then they show up again here around the Great Lakes. And we have lots of those coastal plain disjunct species uh, within this chain of lakes region as well. Uh, Steve mentioned Chamberlain Lake, that's one of the hot spots for some of these uh, coastal plain disjuncts. And of course, lots of conservative species, like I mentioned, those plants with the sea values and conservation values of, of eight, nine, and ten. Um, given what we do know, there's still a lot that we don't know about the, uh, the natural areas that could be present in this area, um, this chain of lakes region. We happened upon light bog all because Jerry Wilhelm asked me about a plant that might occur in the region. Uh, otherwise, that place still could be undiscovered and it could have been sold to somebody else when that, when that sale happened, uh, as opposed to being sold to a land trust. Um, <clears throat> and with that, a lot of the area is already developed. There are a lot of invasive species that have taken over portions of it, so it is threatened uh, quite a bit by these different threats as well. Um, only a small percentage is actually protected. So there are some, some green spaces, some natural areas. Of those, the only ones that are actually protected, I think, are Chamberlain and Lake Bog. I guess Mud Lake sort of being owned by the city, but that's still at risk. Um, there are no other protected areas. In there. there are different areas have different Deer. levels of protection. There's Deer Lake, which um, the Nature Conservancy owns some property along the north edge of Deer Lake. Um, we have North Chain Lake or Bass Lake it has a, a public boat access and um, boat access launch, which changes the law in Indiana. If you have a, uh, if you're considered a publicly accessible lake like that, it um, there are specific laws as to what the landowners along the lake can and cannot do. But yeah, Chamberlain Lake is on the southern edge is really the only one up until. At uh, this point, which really has some sort of protection to it, and, and even light at bog, as you mentioned, only a portion of that. About two thirds of light at bog is actually protected. So there's more work to be done. We have to figure out the uh, the means of protecting the rest of the bog for sure. Um, there's, I think, three different parcels that make up that remaining one third area of the bog. But if we start looking bigger picture, and you may remember from one of the earlier slides, I showed that the, um, the Chain of Lakes Conservation Club owned a big chunk of land next to the Burwich property, and the South Bend Airport Authority owned another big chunk. And so now we're starting to put some of these puzzle pieces together um, towards this, this larger corridor approach. Individuals can and did make a difference, which is, is pretty astonishing to think that his, uh, Scott's conversation with, uh, with Jerry resulted two and a half years later or two years later into the, the permanent protection of 180 acres of land in the county. And it also increased awareness for that area as well as with um, some of the, the other lakes there that we're looking at. Um, and more, pro more property needs to be acquired. It's really important to talk about the means in which more property that can be acquired, and it all boils down to one thing, and that one thing is money, trying to figure out where the money is going to come from for these properties. So I've been contacted by a number of people from the county that said, you know, this is a really cool property over here, this is a great property over there, and we'll surely hang by that too. And my answer to them is, I'm sure that they would eventually love to, but if we're going to be expecting them to do things like that and the community also has to come together to figure out means of 
raising money to be able to buy these properties. We don't have the Bicentennial Land Trust anymore. That money is all gone. Indiana used to have something called the Indiana Heritage uh, Land Trust, which has now been renamed the Benjamin Harrison Land Trust. And if you have the environmental license plates, a portion of the money from the environmental license plates goes into the Benjamin Her Harrison Land Trust, Board, which is underfunded. There's not very much money that's being generated by that. Not enough to be able to make serious changes anyway. And I think that brings us to the end. Do you have anything to add?
remember looking, um, he was at his house in North Liberty, and I was at my house in New Carlisle, and we were both looking at that Google Earth map, and we were, we were zooming in on that area, and Scott's telling me, well, I see a moat, and I see camera racks, and I'm like, you don't. <laughs> you can't see that stuff from outer space. And then, we, then we got there, and I'm like, yep, that's a moat, and that's camera rack. Another good reason to park with people, obviously, yes, to give you a question. Um, so, obviously hard to get in, but gorgeous, so thank you for all the pictures. Uh, and so what is coming for Lighting Bog now that it's owned by the Land Trust is public access. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. So this is something that, you know, it's hard to get to. It's obviously something you don't want to step on in the land or anything else that maybe you haven't even seen yet. So what are your thoughts on public access on here? Um, this is a good question. So, about um, know, six months ago or so, the South Bend Tribune ran a Sunday, it was a slow news day or something, so the Sunday cover, or the cover of the Sunday paper, was an um, elusive blog found in, in Lighting. And um, on the, uh, the South Bend Tribune Facebook page, there were a few people that were kind of lived in that area and they were like, oh, that's, you're ruining it. What are you doing? You're gonna, people are going to get there, come in there, and they're going to trash it. And, um, why are you doing this? You should just leave it alone. The argument against leaving it alone, obviously, is that anybody could buy it and they could do whatever they want to with it. If they wanted to um, put in a, a ATV course or something through it, you know, what's to stop them? So clearly this was a better um, way of going for that. But in terms of how, do you, how do we manage the, the fragility of that property, but yet yeah, allow public access is a good one. And the answer is that they're not going to, there's not going to be public access through the bog for a couple of reasons. One, it is a very fragile ecosystem and walking, people walking through there will trample things and not, that, that may not come back. The other thing is that it's, there's a, a, certainly a specific um, amount of danger to, um, and liability associated with having some people in there too. A bog is, basically an old lake that is now covered with a floating mass of vegetation. So when we're out there walking on a map, and if you've never been to a bog, and probably most people in the room have never been to a bog, if you stand on the map and go like this, you can literally see shrubs like 50 feet away bouncing up and down. Um, so there's a, there's a danger of actually breaking through that and falling in and not being able to climb out. So the solution, what they're going to do in this particular case, the long-term plan, which they're raising money for, is to develop a trail system that is um, that creates the smallest amount of disturbance possible. There was an old logging road, so the upland area had been logged um, based on the, the condition of the stumps, I would guess, somewhere around 20 years ago. There were a lot of trees taken out of there. There's still a lot of good trees remaining. But they created this logging road, so there's already this disturbance um, that exists there. So the logging road will then become a trail. And once we get to a uh, where the logging road ends, the land trust will, will build a continual trail that, that, that disturbs the least amount of quality things as possible. And once you get to the bog, they plan to build an overlook platform. So you can stand uh, on the edge of the bog and see into the bog without actually going in there and trying to find things. So it is extremely important to get people to see these kind of headcats. We showed photographs of the bog. If you've never been to the bog, those photographs don't do justice. Right? So you need to be able to see it, you need to be able to respect it, to be able to watch it or put your money forward to preserve something like that. So the education component is huge. And it's a very delicate balance, as you said, to be able to, to educate people, show them that bog, but not let them destroy the bog at the same time. So, there are other bogs in the, in the region, um, just north of Michigan, there's a bog called Mud Lake Bog that has a boardwalk, a kind of floating boardwalk that goes through the bog. And if you've never seen a bog, I encourage everyone to go see it there. Very similar habitats to what you would see out at Lake Bog. So I think, you know, balancing it by only having boardwalks or trails through some of these, uh, these pristine habitats is one way of educating at the same time as Okay, I just have one more. I, I know I've got students in the audience, so you know, I always want to find out about the environmental aspect and the social aspect, but the, the, the culture is the economic piece. Um, so, 
what do you think the potential is for this land trust is preserved um, to have uh, on the local economy? Is this going to increase property values around there because we have a, a preserved space? Are people, you know, is it going to be a tourist spot for, you know, plant geeks everywhere? Um, what's going to, did you see any economic impact from preserving this space? We were hoping you were going to ask. Yes, okay. <laughs> 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 I think I'm going to go to everyone to talk about this in the program that Scott said that she asked that. There's been a lot of thought and uh, belief put in by large companies, such as like Google and Facebook, for example, um, actively look for areas that have quality natural areas in them, where, where they locate their offices, because it, it has a positive effect on their employees' overall well-being, their health, their own walking, they're able to go out uh, get away from the, the mayhem of the city and get someplace to unwind. So I think it's a it's a huge uh, benefit to the, it's, this is outside the city property, but it's still really part of the South Bend region. I think it's a big benefit to the city of South Bend to have um, these protected natural areas that people can go to and, and escape and get into nature. Uh, as far as the land values, I would certainly think that it would, uh, it would affect or would help out the land values of some of the uh, of the, air, the, the neighbors over there as well. Uh, yeah, um, well, so yeah, I don't, I don't see scores of buses coming to the lake to visit the mall, but if you think back to uh, the Cape Key Marsh, you know, you probably read about Cape Key Marsh, you know that Teddy Roosevelt used to hunt there, he'd bring people to hunt there. That place all the other ways in the north. If we would have had a foresight back then to protect what was there, that place could actually be a tourist attraction. I mean, look at the people, the other people who go the other ways in Florida, we could have the same thing um, as a tourist spot up here in like West Indiana. So at this point, I don't see it with a, the expansion of the conservation corridor. Eventually, you could have more people coming just to see that area, go birding there, to see the plants there, just to hike there, uh, various different uses. <laughs> so yeah, the educational element to it as well. We had uh, mentioned the, the idea that the Heinz wants to build a uh, parking lot where they can get buses in out there. So we have this this real situation, I think, in this country where we have teachers who are uh, edu environmental education is not part of the state uh, teaching curriculum, or, or very little of it is. We have a few teachers here and there that take it upon themselves to go out of their way on their own time to do environmental education projects. And I think that all of this really goes back to the fact that now we have, um, for the first time in the history of the United States, a generation or two of, of teachers who have grown up um, detached from nature. And so it's not, it was not part of their, of the childhood of the, of most of the, the 20 or 30 something teachers, the way it was for the older generation who remembers that old wood lot before it was a Walmart. They used to go there and, and catch tadpoles and, and watch them turn into frogs and that sort of thing. So, by having these natural areas available um, and having active education programs, like Shirley Hines participates in a program called the Mighty Acorns, which um, is an environmental education curriculum. Getting the kids out there young, it, it instills upon them the value um, of these of nature and of these wild spaces that, uh, that we, we've kind of lost touch of. Okay, so now it's your turn. Um, what other questions do you have about uh, issues they raised or didn't touch on that you would like to ask? Um, I'm remembering that the Shirley Hanks Land Trust was trying to get up to 3,000 within the next five years or so. I was curious if you had any land already picked out like any spots that you were looking What's next on your business? You may be able to answer this better than I am, but I, I know that they have looked at uh, corridors around the properties that they have, and properties around the properties that they have. One example is Amber Flatlands in the Fort County. Uh, that started as 300 acres, I believe. Those are the smaller ones now. Because this was 
This was actually the lighting, the purchase of the Hurwitz property of 178 acres was the, the largest ever one time purchased by Shirley Hines Land Trust. So they, they usually have done things much smaller. So yeah, I don't have the acres, but, but Anna Flat would start as a very small property. At that time, they looked at all the adjacent properties. It's a, the Flatwoods community is a globally imperiled community um, with lots of northern species that reach the southern extent here in, in northwest Indiana. And so they looked at all the properties surrounding that and said, okay, we'd like to have that one goes up for sale. This one's pretty nice. This one would be better, but it doesn't have a really good quality. They prioritized those. And then when those properties came up for sale, they would purchase what they could. And so Amber is now a much larger preserve than it once was. So they have sort of picked out properties that, that they they want. I don't know what the next property is going to be. I know they're looking at some other counties in the region as well. Um, so it, it may be a while before they move further to St. Joe County or buy additional property in St. Joe County, but um, with the support of the community, hopefully they continue to do that. The support of the community. Support of the community is uh, is critical because um, I'm involved with Shirley Heights Land Trust and. Um, Advisory expansion committee, advisory committee, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they um, they would love to be able to protect hundreds of acres in St. Joseph County, thousands of acres in St. Joseph County, but um, they're also very afraid of biting off more than they can chew. Um, with the purchase of any of these properties, it's it's of course not just a a one-time deal. Even the even lighting fog is high as quality as it is. The the fog itself is pristine. The areas around it um, have been degraded somewhat. There's invasive species there. The, the logging that was done probably uh, brought in seeds of exotic things on, on the trucks that barreled their way through there. Now there's, uh, there's multiple rows and, and um, burning bush that are, that are in the preserve there. So, yeah, there's other properties for sure in St. Joseph County that we've discussed with them that, or that everybody, uh, the various people have on their, their wish list. Um, but I think Heinz has, has made it pretty clear that they're not going to go forward with much more until they, they're finished uh, with what they started at Lydic, which is um, raising $50,000 to buy that, that, uh, that old farmhouse and the two acres. Um, another $50,000 would, like, would go into raising all of the buildings there. Another forty or 50000 goes into putting in a uh, parking lot and some restrooms, and another fifty thousand goes into trail improvements. So there's we're, we're talking a couple hundred thousand dollars here that um, has to be raised probably before they're going to be able to um, to, to grab on on any other properties. That's, that's kind of my instinct anyway. I saw a hand back here. Um, so I know now that my is protected. You guys. Taking notes, taking plants, how did you get all this data? Uh, yeah, as, as we walked, I, I had a notebook and I was recording everything we saw. There are some species that you need to collect a sample of and you know, use that plants in Chicago region that I showed as an example um, to run it through the, the dichotomous keys to figure out what species it is. But most of it, um, most of it I know on site, and so we just recorded everything. So we took some photographs as well, but uh, most of it was recorded on site. I've been with Scott out in the field many times, and um, he, is, he is a furious and efficient note taker. Um, he'll pull something out of his pocket, and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm wandering around going, oh, look at this, look at this, and by the time I get done my sentence, he's recorded 20 species of, plat, uh, of plants in their taxonomic Latin names. In his little notebook, and uh, we go we'll go back afterwards, and I'll say I didn't even see half of that stuff, and we paid attention. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I question. Um, so you guys said um, that this area has ninety five percent native plants. Um, I was just wondering, like, why? So, what are like the ecological impacts of having a lower percentage of native? Are they like are they more invasive species or how does that kind of uh, lessen the quality of the land having those non-native species there? Um, so there are I don't even know which I think there are three 
thousand ish plants in Indiana, about a thousand plants are non native plants. Of those non native plants, some are extremely aggressive in the face, and others are, as I think, are in the are in your yard, but they're not noxious weeds that have to take over. Uh, things like what Steve mentioned all before, the really burning bush, weed care, grass, common weed, purple and striped, those are some of our worst uh, garlic plants, those are some of our worst invasive plants. And when those show up at a site, it's often a result of some kind of disturbance, um, ground disturbance or inflow of additional nutrients that, that, uh, that they thrive on. And so there's, a, there's usually a, a cause that we're not seeing that is leading to that invasion by invasive species, but once they become established, the conditions are right for them and they spread pretty rapidly in some of those more invasive ones. And so it's not so much a, a number of species thing as it is a density issue. And we didn't do any kind of sampling to tell what the density of invasive species was, but I can mean, just tell you from, from what we saw or not, there's not a very low density of invasive species. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. I mean, no doubt that the invasive species are also pushing out the native species. And the native species, which we consider a native species, is something that's been here since the last ice age. Uh, plants and animals have a very complex, have developed a very complex relationship, and much of which science has yet to really fully understand, particularly when it comes down to uh, mycorrhizal fungi and things. But, Insects, in particular, have um, developed many many insects. Most insects, most least, most leaf-eating insects, have developed very specialized relationships with plants. We think of the, the situation we have with the monarch butterfly and the milkweed plant, for example. That's that's one example because the monarch is a very charismatic example that everybody knows. But the fact of the matter is that there that most of the insect world relies on. Um, a fairly narrow range of plants in which they're, they're able to um, lay their eggs on. So if you, if you think about it, I mean, plants are, are full of nasty compounds which make them very distasteful for most things, but insects have figured out ways of, of, of um, circumventing these compounds and processing them with specialization. So when we take the native plants out of the ecosystem, we're also removing the insects that are part of that ecosystem, and then everything else above the food chain that relies on the insects such as birds. And we have time like two more. Yeah, we could. Um, and the opposite side of what Steve just said, these plants that are brought over that are not native, in their native lands, they're a lot of times kept and checked by those insects that, that are adapted to them. You bring the plant here, the insect's not here, the plants are going to go wild because there's nothing to keep in check. Are there any measures that you're taking um, right now to help plants what's in the box? To help plants. Help protect what's in the bog from the invasive species. So that's, I guess, that's that's part of the role of the land trust. They will um, go out there and control. There aren't too many. Do you remember? There's a little bit of a cattail. Cattail, yeah, a little cattail. There aren't too many invasive plants actually in the bog itself. Most of them are around the outside perimeter of the mountains. Um, but that's part of what the land trust will do is, is go out there and remove those invasive plants before they become well established. The land trust, um, really, the Shirley Land Land Trust has, what, maybe four or five um, staff <coughs> members, and the rest of the, so the work is being done, they think they have thousands of acres, but they only have a few people to do it, so they rely heavily on volunteer help, and um, I'm sure in the future, sometime, there will be volunteer work days where regular citizens will be encouraged to come out there, um, spend a, an afternoon on a weekend helping cut and, and pile invasive shrubs and things like that. That's, uh, that's really important. I found it interesting that there's some report that's been done by the Nature Conservancy and some of the big box sort of uh, nurseries to not sell some of these, you know, they don't sell burning bush anymore because that's going to be bad to get out there and take over. It's been really heartening to see that there's efforts large and small. Uh, it's a slow cool process, though. Yeah. <laughs> we still plant, uh, our city still plants invasive species along the roads. So. Yes, we do. So, oh, uh, oh gosh, in the back. Okay. Um, you mentioned the um, glacier. Um, I've heard about that in the end. How long ago was that? The glacier was 15,000 years? 15,000 ish years ago. So we had um, 
in our, in our full three-hour program, I read a dissertation from um, Dr. Victor Riemenschneider, who's Professor Emeritus here, um, who had studied the, the geology and the soil science of the area. And essentially, the Vic's, my layman's interpretation of Vic's explanation was that you had two glacial lobes that came down together. Um, uh, what were the names of them, Scott? The uh, Saginaw lobe and the Lake Michigan lobe, maybe? And they met in that area, these two lobes. And so the, so our, our, our talk was called When, when Glaciers Collide, uh, the three-hour one. Um, you can imagine these enormous blocks of ice that, that smack together there. And, um, <coughs> ah, there we go. Yeah. And um, so that's... Uh, so, yeah. So, one on the right, so you have the map on the right. This brown area is where the two glaciers came together and dropped a bunch of material. So, that's actually a ridge that runs through here. If you look to the east or to the west, it's extremely, extremely flat. That's where the glaciers came and scoured the land and made it very flat. That area would have been prairie historically. This area up here was more of an oak barren, oak savanna type habitat with these spots where the ice chunks sunk in and then melted and created <laughs> such an exotic, interesting place that I live. Um, we don't have to go to Madagascar to see this stuff. It's right here. Right. Uh, so I'm going to close the formal questions. They're not running out the door. They're going to be here for a while. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, and you really, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer your questions if you want to come up and say hi and get a little deeper. Thank you both so much for uh, Next week, uh, our talk is on electronics recycling, which you've been paying attention to for the last year has been a real challenge and issue for us here. So we've got a local electronics recycler who will be here to eliminate that. So hope to see you soon.